no matter what you do. You have four tanks that you're replenished, that you are draining. An emotional tank, a mental tank, a physical tank, and a spiritual tank. What you have to do is figure out what replenishes your tanks. What replenishes you emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. My burden is to help you understand how harmful stress is to you and how you can be in ministry and not be stressed out. I look back, Pastor Jimmy and I were talking this morning, um, when you get to our age and have been in ministry as long as we have, you start thinking, why didn't I enjoy it more? Why didn't I just relax? I mean, the only thing I had to do was hold up a stick and God parted the Red Sea. Why did I get so stressed out about holding up a stick? Are y'all hearing me? I, I remember when I first started meeting with Dr. Henry Cloud, I, he said, what stresses you the most? And I immediately said, the weekend messages. Uh, pastor Brady Boyd, when he, he was associate senior pastor here and went to New Life, he's doing a great job there. And as the senior pastor, he made a comment. He, after about a year of being there, he said, Sundays come around at an alarming rate. <laughs> and any senior pastor or any person in ministry understands that, whatever your responsibilities are. He said, sometimes I'll preach a great message and on the way home, I think, what am I gonna do next week? Anyone ever felt that? And uh, so I was talking to Pastor, I mean, I was talking to Dr. Cloud one in one of our sessions, and um, I said, what, what stresses me the most are weekend messages. And he said, why? And I said to him, well, because, Henry, I have to hit a home run. People expect me to hit a home run. I, I hit home runs. That's, that's what I do. I, I work on the message normally uh, 15 to 25 hours during the week. And I, and I craft it, and I, I know where, how to do the timing of it. I know how to add humor. I know what makes a good message. And it's very, very tough, and it takes everything out of me. It takes everything I have to hit a home run. And then for some reason, I think God allows this to happen when I'm with Henry because it kind of reveals something in my heart that I didn't know was there, you know? And uh, so, and I, I just said to Henry, I said, it takes everything I have to hit home runs. And then I said to him, and I can hit home runs. <laughs> just like that. I said, I can hit home runs. And Henry sat there a minute, and then he said, well, well it is great to meet you. <laughs> he said, I'll bet you can walk on water and raise the dead too. <laughs> he said, Robert, my Bible tells me that there's only one who can hit home runs and you're not him. And all you can do is swing the bat. And right after that, uh, I met with him the very next week was Easter. And you know, that's the Super Bowl for pastors, you know. <laughs> And I was getting, starting to get stressed, and I thought, I don't have to hit a home run. I just have to swing the bat. Amen. And you know what was amazing? I went into that Easter so relaxed and so refreshed, and just, hey, God, if you don't do it, I'll just, well, I'm swinging the bat. If it doesn't go with the fence, it's your fault, you know? <laughs> so, but, but what was amazing was all my friends and staff came up to me after and said, that is the best Easter message you have ever <laughs> preached in your life. And I thought, thanks. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about stress. And I want to, you saw the little commercial for the, the new book that's coming out, Take the Day Off. And it comes out at the end of this month. And you can actually go to, I think, takethedayoffbook.com and download the first two chapters. I, I have never in my life preached a message because a book was coming out. I want you to know that. And I'm not doing that this time. Um, but it's my burden. So I have to nail this down because the worst people I know at taking a day off are people in ministry. 
whether it's vocational ministry or volunteer ministry, any type of church leadership, we're the worst. So I want to talk to you about, that's the title of the message, is Take the Day Off. Um, and I'm going to do something I've actually never, ever done. I'm going to read two paragraphs from this, the new book that I wrote. And the reason is because I've thought about it over and over and over again, and I thought, I can't say it as well as I wrote it. And so here's, here's the way chapter two starts, okay? The report submitted to the government of Japan simply called him Mr. A to protect his identity. Let's call him Mr. Asako. He had worked for several years at a major Japanese snack food processing company, often putting in as many as 110 hours a week. Now, for those of you that don't do math well, just uh, I'll help you a little bit, but 110 hours a week. Just to put that into perspective, all right, that's more than two and a half 40-hour work weeks jammed into one. To log 110 hours in a week requires working nearly 16 hours a day for seven days. 16 times seven would be 112. This is 110. So almost 16 hours a day, seven days a week. He did that week after week, year after year. They found Mr. Asako dead at his workstation, the victim of a heart attack. He was 34. In Japan, they call it, let me put this up, Karoshi, I think that's how you would pronounce it. Uh, I don't know though. So the Chinese have their own word for it. It's this word. <laughs> and in South Korea, they call it this word. All three terms were coined recently to describe something so new that their languages did not even have a word for it. When I did study for this book, you just can't imagine what I found out that's going on around the world in this area. These words describe the act, these are new words now in these three languages, these words describe the act of literally working yourself to death. All three Asian cultures discovered they needed a word to describe an increasingly common phenomenon there. Namely, people dropping dead on their jobs as a result of working insane hours under intense pressure with little to no rest. Now, I'm going to put those three things on the screen and say them again. Working insane hours under intense pressure with little to no rest. <clears throat> Sounds like ministry to me. <laughs> Sounds like ministry. Uh, Mike Brisky works with me. Mike was a professional golfer for 15 years and played on the PGA Tour. And when he was on the tour, I actually went with him to a couple of tournaments. And he would get there many times on Tuesday and he would play a practice round, but his practice round was about eight hours because he would look at every shot and every angle and put, you know, put tees all over the green and put where the pin placements would be. And I mean, it was a, a eight to 10 hour day, work day. And I thought playing golf, you know, on the tour was just like fun, you know? And then on Wednesday, he'd play in a program, and, um, which is a lot of work for professionals to play with amateurs. So, uh, but anyway, he'd do that. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday was the tournament. We'd get there three hours before his tee off time. He'd hit balls. He would, he had a routine. He'd, he'd, he'd practice on the putting greens. He did this. Then when we'd finished this round and all I was doing was following him around, but I was exhausted. <laughs> and then when we finished, whatever he didn't like about his game, he'd go to the range and work on it for a couple hours. And then he'd fly home on Sunday afternoon and fly back out on Monday night. So he worked basically six days a week and, and it was, they were long days. But he left the tour and came on our staff as our marriage and family pastor. And after about a month, he called me and said, I have a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, what do you do when you still have calls to make 
and it's five o'clock. And I said, you go home. Because they're going to be there tomorrow. And what he learned was, I don't care what profession you're in, even again, whether you're vocational or, or, or bivocational or non-vocational as far as ministry, maybe you're in business and you're a church leader, there's a difference, and all of our business guys will tell you this. When you step into church leadership, you're not dealing with products anymore. You're dealing with people's lives. You're dealing with eternity. You're dealing with marriages and family and children, and it is stressful. So you've got to learn something. So God did something for all of us that's wonderful. He created a seven-day week. Think about this. It didn't just happen. God could have created a six-day week, a three-day week, a 12-day week. God created a seven-day week. And one of those days was to rest. And God did this. So before we ever get to the law, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 16, he, he gives an example. Let me read that to you. Exodus 16, verse 23. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said, tomorrow is a Sabbath rest. I just want you to notice the word rest. Now listen to me, look at me just for a moment. Here's what's the problem. We're gonna to get to this. When we talk about keeping the Sabbath, here's what I thought that meant growing up, going to church. If, if you keep the Sabbath, that means you go to church on Sunday. That is, there is nothing anywhere in here about going to church. And that's how you keep the Sabbath. Nothing in the Bible. Not one place, not one. Now, I think you should go to church. I agree with going to church once a week. I agree with that. But that's not, it doesn't have one thing to do with the Sabbath. The whole point of the Sabbath was to stop working one day a week. It was to rest one day a week. So this is when he's doing the manna, providing manna for him in the wilderness. This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. If you remember the previous days when they had tried to keep some for the next day, by the next day it was stinking and had worms in it because God was trying to teach them, I'll provide every day what you need. But on Friday, the sixth day, he was providing enough for the seventh day and it didn't stink the next day. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Now watch this. Today, you will not find it in the field. Listen to me very carefully. God, if you need a report done or a message written, God will not provide it for you on the seventh day. He will only provide it on the other six days. He will not give you manna from heaven on the Sabbath. Did y'all hear that? That was better than you thought. <laughs> I mean, you can study all you want. You will got, not get anything from God on the day you're supposed to be resting. He, you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, watch this, there will be none. Whatever provision you need for work that day, he already provided it. He won't provide it that day. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day together, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. By the way, it's a gift from God. Why would you not unwrap it? <laughs> Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man, and, and ladies, just to remind you, the word man is mankind. Human, woe man, you're a man too. <laughs> now you're woe man, but you're still, okay. <clears throat> let no, let every man remain in his place. Let no man, let no human go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, why did God do this? Obviously, 
because he doesn't want us to have any fun. <laughs> no, obviously because he does want us to enjoy this life and he wants you to enjoy ministry. I heard Pastor Jimmy say one time, he said, oh God, he said, the only verse I don't believe in the Bible that you, I think you messed up on was come to me if you're weary because my burden is light and easy. And he said, it's not light and it's not easy. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. It's heavy and it's hard. And the Lord said to him, that's not my burden. That's not my burden. You've, you've taken on your own burden. Listen, if I get stressed out over the weekend message, that is not God's burden. That could be going to something inside of me wanting to just perform and do a good job. And God wants to deal with that in me. So here are a few points about it. I think I have five for this message. So here's number one. It's a commandment. Taking the day off is a commandment. Here's the commandment. It's the fourth commandment. I want you to notice too, there's nothing about going to church. Again, I'm for going to church. But that's not what the commandment's about. Exodus 20, verse eight. This is the fourth commandment. It's three verses long. Remember, by the way, it's the longest commandment. So apparently it's pretty important because he had to spend more time on it because he knew that we would argue with him about it. <laughs> Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy or to keep it set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your emails. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just wanted to bring it up to modern. That's a modern translation. You shall do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do, can you say that word? No, no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle. He doesn't even want your cows working. <laughs> nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Hallow comes from the same root word as holy, set it apart. Okay. So this is one of God's top 10. Does everyone agree with that? Okay, aren't you glad that since we're under grace, we don't need to keep the 10 commandments anymore? As Christians, because I, I hear this all the time, hey, pastor, we're under grace, not law. So I guess I can murder people <laughs> as a Christian because I'm under grace and I can lie and I can steal, and I can covet, commit adultery, have idols, take God's name in vain? No. Now, we don't keep the Ten Commandments to get saved, obviously, but are there blessings if you do? And are there, and are there consequences if you don't? So let's just, here's the thing, please, you gotta get this. This is the only commandment that Christians believe we don't have to keep. We believe that we should not have any gods before him. We believe we should not have idols, right? Y'all don't have little Buddhas around your house you pray to, right? Okay. We, we, we believe that we should not take his name in vain. Everyone agree with this? Okay, let's skip the fourth one for a moment. We believe we should honor our mother and father. We should not lie. We should not steal. We should not murder. We should not commit adultery and we should not covet. Do you agree with that? Amen. Then why do you not rest one day a week? It's in the same list as the other nine I just gave you. It's a commandment. Here's number two, it's a witness. I don't know if you realize this, but for thousands of years, it was the greatest witness on the planet that there was a God. And I'll show you this. Exodus 31 verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy to you, set apart. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. It carried the death penalty. Along with murder, adultery, and disobedient to your uh, parents. So you, you know, you could tell your children sometime, you know, if we were in the Old Testament, you'd be dead right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
You talk about being stoned, you do, and it's a different, never mind. Okay, all right, so. <laughs> Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any emails, any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Does it say going to church? It says rest. Holy to the Lord, to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. There's the law of redundance in the Bible. The Bible says that twice in just a few verses. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, and we've been grafted in. I don't need to go through Romans 11 and Ephesians 2 with you, do you? We're fellow citizens, and we've been grafted into the nation of Israel. So they shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations. Now watch this word, as a perpetual covenant. Anyone want to tell me the meaning of the word perpetual? <laughs> no end. It is a sign or a witness between me and the children of Israel, what's that word? Forever. Forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Okay, now, uh, let me go to a little theology for you. There probably are not many of you here that would like to theologically explain to me how God was refreshed. The God who never sleeps, who never gets tired, never gets weary, how in the world could God get refreshed? Well, any time again, you, you wanna understand something, you take it in whole with all of scripture, it's co called cohesive exegesis. And you look at the context, but you look at the whole of scripture, but also go to the original language. So the original language in the Hebrew, let me tell you what this word refresh means. It means took breath. It means to inhale. It means he breathed in. Okay, what had God been doing for six days? Creating, right? But how does God create? He speaks. What do you do when you speak? You breathe out. You exhale, right? So for six days, God had been breathing out. On the seventh day, God breathed in. Have you ever said, boy, if I could just catch my breath. God set it up where you get a whole day to do that every week. And for some reason, we just don't think it applies to us. I understand we're not under the law. But you understand that the laws are also principles in which to live by. <laughs> They're principles that are for our good. So it's a witness to the whole world. Let me, let me just tell you what I mean by it's a witness to the whole world too. Um, uh, uh, let's say a nation was doing business with Israel. And again, let's just use email. And let's say that the guy emails this, let's, let's say it was a hundred, you know, thousands years ago, but he, we're going to bring email into it. Let's say he emails and says, hey, listen, I'll be in town on Saturday and we can close this deal on Saturday. The Jewish person would email back, uh, sorry, we're closed on Saturdays. We, we don't work on Saturdays. The secular person would email back, why are you closed on Saturdays? Jewish person email back, because it's the Sabbath. Secular person, why is, what's the Sabbath? And they would say, well, it's the day that God rested. God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Therefore, we rest on the seventh. Secular person right back, which God? What, what God? Tell me more about this God that created the world in six days. You follow me? It's a witness. All right, here's number three. God is serious about it. God is serious about it. Numbers 15, verse 32. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. I want you to notice what he was doing, gathering sticks. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. And they put him under guard. Well, of course, he's a stick gatherer. <laughs> I 
You got to guard that guy. Because it had not been explained what should be done to him. It had been explained. They just didn't want to do it. Then the Lord said to Moses. So this wasn't just Moses. This was the Lord said to Moses. The man must surely be put to death. I would say God is serious about it. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones and he died. Remember my point is God is serious. So let me, let me say it this way. Are you being slowly put to death by not resting one day a week? Does God want you to live to this age, but you're gonna die 12 years before that, like Mr. Osako who died at 34 because he'd already put in a lifetime of work by the time he was 34. I, uh, years and years ago, I was trying to schedule lunch with this pastor friend of mine. And so back then we had day timers, you know, and I had my day timer out and he had his day timer out. And uh, so we were saying, what about, you know, next Tuesday? Uh, no, I'm doing this. What about Wednesday? No, I'm doing this. I said, what about Thursday? I said, what do you have on Thursday? He said, nothing. I said, great, let's have lunch. He said, uh, no, um, um, I'm, I, I can't do it on Thursday. I said, yeah, but um, you said you don't have anything scheduled. He said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I said, okay, so let's do it Thursday. He said, no, Robert, you don't understand. Next Thursday, I have nothing scheduled. <laughs> Next Thursday, I'm scheduled to do nothing. <laughs> Next Thursday, I'm going to do nothing. And then he said, and I'd like to tell you about it when we do get together for lunch. So I said, okay. So we get together and he says to me, I forgot exactly how long, but he was in his early 50s when it happened and this was a few years later, I guess. Uh, but he said to me, I was in a hospital and I was dying. And the doctor said, we don't know why you're dying. Your organs are shutting down and we don't know why. And he said one night in the hospital room at night, I couldn't sleep. And I said to God, God, I've served you. I'm in the ministry, I'm a pastor. Why are you doing this to me? And God said, son, I'm not doing this to you. You did this to you. He said, you've not kept the fourth commandment. You don't rest one day a week. You don't rest one day a week. And please hear me, you say, well, does it have to be Saturday, which was Jewish seventh day, is it Sunday? I work on the weekends, pastor. It's, it's your seventh day to me. That's how the New Testament says it. It's, it's, it. There is a Sabbath still for the people of God. But if you have to work on Sunday, it might not be Sunday. For me, it's Monday. But so what it's, you got, but it's the principle is rest one day a week. That's the principle. But he said to me, I'm in the hospital, and the Lord said, you, you profaned the Sabbath. You killed yourself. I didn't kill you, you killed yourself. God is so good, and he said to him, well, Lord, is there any way that I could have forgiveness and get grace? And he said, the Lord said to him, of course. And he said, I felt strength come in my body. And he said, I actually unplugged myself, got up, got dressed, and walked out of the hospital and have not been back since. He said, but you better believe I rest one day a week now. So on that Thursday, I did nothing. I rested. And that pastor, I was invited to his memorial, but I didn't get to go. Years and years later, he died at a, a ripe old age. 
I, it was, I, I, I know about the age, but I'm not going to say it because some of you might be of that age and you might think, I'm not right. <laughs> so, <laughs> ripeness is getting farther along the older I get. Effect. You know, you say, that guy lived a long life. Now I'm thinking, that's not that long. All right. <laughs> Here's number four. Unobserved Sabbaths accumulate. This one will get you. Unobserved Sabbaths accumulate. Second Chronicles 36, verse 20 and 21. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon. This is the Babylonian exile where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, that'd be Cyrus, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, watch this phrase, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. I didn't even know land could enjoy something, but the Bible says it did. The land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath. That's the land. The land kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So what was the principle? Every seven years, they were supposed to let the land rest, right? Seven years went by and they didn't do it. And so then another seven years go by and they didn't let the land rest then. And then another seven years went by. Okay, how many years? So if every seven years, now again, this is math, so some of you can check out, I'll tell you the answer and I don't even have to see your work. But they're supposed to let it rest every seven years and se they let 70 of those seven years pass, so 70 times seven, so how long did they go without letting the land rest? <laughs> it's so funny to look at the blank expressions <laughs> on your, and I'm used to it because my wife has that same expression when I talk math there. 490 years. They went 490 years without letting land rest. So I have a simple question for you. If you went 490 years doing something that you weren't supposed to do, would you start thinking that you were getting away with it? Not with God. The first seven years went by, they didn't let the land rest. God was up in heaven and went, one. 14 years, two. 21 years, three, 28, four, 35, five. God just marked, and when they got 70 years, he said, that's it. And he takes them out of the land to let the land rest. If he cares about land, how much more does he care about you? And if you've been to Israel, it is a fertile garden in the middle of a desert because this principle works. But unobserved Sabbaths accumulate. Here's number five. God made the Sabbath for our benefit. It's a blessing, not a burden. Mark chapter two Verse 23, it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of the God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Let me paraphrase that a bit. He was saying, uh, I didn't make you to serve the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath to serve you. I made the Sabbath for your benefit. So, so uh, Jesus also covered emergencies. You know, he said, listen, if your ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, pull it out. So if you have an emergency, okay, sure, I understand that. I mean, don't get a phone call, you know, pastor, the church is on fire, it's my Sabbath, you know. <laughs> I 
You, you can handle an emergency, okay? Jesus said that. Listen, if you have an emergency, take care of it. But listen to me. If an emergency comes up every week, you're a bad manager. You gotta get some systems and some policies in place so you can rest. And you have got to be principled about it. I was standing around the office one day talking, and by the way, again, Monday's my Sabbath, but here's Monday, and I'm working. But I took some other time off last week, and I'm taking some more off after the conference. So it doesn't have to be the same day every week. Every, it just has to be one day out of seven. That's the point, rest. But I was standing in the office one day when this principle was new in my life and I was trying to get it in the whole staff and I was standing around talking with four or five pastors and one of them said, hey, pastor, I know Mondays are your Sabbath, but would you do this uh, on a Monday? And um, I ju just to make the point, I just said to him, uh, why don't you ask me to commit adultery while you're at it? <laughs> and let's, you know, knock over a 7-Eleven and shoot some people on the way too. <laughs> I said, I just want to make a point. You just asked me to break one of the 10 commandments. Why don't you, which, which other one you want me to break too? I, I, I can remember, again, when we were small, I'd get an email from one of the staff members because I said, Monday's my Sabbath, unless we have to rearrange for a conference or something, Monday's my Sabbath. I'd get an email, you know, and ask me a question, and I'd email back just to point, get the point in to them, what day is this? And you get an email back, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you just have to get principled about it. Um... Rest must be scheduled. Do you schedule work? Let me just ask you, when you say, hey, uh, let's get together and we're gonna have a meeting and the whole this department, the worship department's gonna have this meeting and it's gonna be this night at seven o'clock at this building, do you schedule meetings? Hello, anyone? <laughs> okay, you have to schedule rest. Now I'm gonna shock you. All of my rest days for next year, 2020, have already been scheduled. Here's what's great about that. Someone calls and asks you to speak, you say, um, I'm already scheduled that day. <laughs> I am. I'm scheduled to do nothing that day. <laughs> when we minister every day, no matter what you do, you have four tanks that, you're that you are draining. An emotional tank, a mental tank, a physical tank, and a spiritual tank. What you have to do is figure out what replenishes your tanks. What replenishes you emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And that's what you do. Okay, when I teach pastors on this, sometimes we'll do a pastor school and we'll have a small group of pastors and I'll teach on this and then I'll say any questions. Okay, I know what the first question is gonna be. Pastor Robert, what do you do on your Sabbath? I, I realize I'm talking to a workaholic <laughs> because he or she's been going through their mind the whole time thinking, well, what would I do for a whole day? <laughs> well, here's a person that doesn't know how to rest. So I say, when they, they say, well, what do you do on your Sabbath? Here's the answer to that question. That's the wrong question. The question is not what do I do? The question is what do I not do on the Sabbath? And here's what I don't do, work. Now that doesn't mean I might not work around the house, might play golf, might go to the lake, might go to a movie, might do, but I don't do work. I don't study, I don't write messages, I don't answer emails about work, I don't do work. And it is harder today than any day ever to not do work one day a week because we carry our office with us everywhere we go. It is horrible. We used to have a work phone and a home phone. And people wouldn't think about calling you at home 
They just wait till, I'll just wait till tomorrow. Now they will send you an email at 2 a.m. And if you keep it close to you just because you want to use that alarm, listen, they have alarms at Walmart for $9.99. They don't last for about three months, but it's not, it's okay. You can get another one because they got another one too. But have you ever uh, awakened in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom or something and just look at your phone and then can't go back to sleep? Or forget to turn it to silent and be just dozing off. Bing. I remember when we first got into the phones and all, and of course, Debbie and I now, I make her keep, a very, keep her number very private, uh, email private, all that. Because I have a work email and a, and a personal email. I don't really call it private anymore. It's personal. So if this has to do with work, do not email me on my personal email or text me. It's amazing how pastors will text you, can you come speak at my conference? This is a work matter. I have a a staff that schedules that. Why don't you just go through the office, you know? So you just have to train people, you have to train them. But I remember when when I was first learning this principle and cell phones were a little newer at that time and um, Debbie's phone every night at midnight would go bing. And when she's asleep, she's asleep. I mean, like coma sleep. <laughs> but I would, I'd go to sleep about 11, 11.30. I'd just be in that, just getting there, bing. And I would, I would think to myself, who is texting my wife at midnight every night? Every night. And so one night, bing, I thought, that's it. <laughs> I am going to text this person back and I'm gonna say, this is Pastor Robert, and you stop texting my wife at midnight every night. I don't care how good of a friend you are, you're out, you know, I'm, I'm sick of it. You know, I was, I was gonna give it to him. What I found out was, she had this scripture that God was giving her, and she said on a reminder, and, and I go over and I look at her phone, and here's what it says, guard your heart. All right, so let me tell you one more story how God, we also not only do Sabbaths, where it's one day a week, but we give all of our pastors and, and that level, which they're called directors then, on, if they're not pastors, but they're at that level of ministry, that's just as much ministry to do what the pastor does. What a lot of our people do is ministry as well, even though they're not called a pastor. We have all of our pastors and directors sabbaticals every five to seven years, depending on their uh, amount of responsibility. Um, And so they get four weeks vacation and then four weeks extra every five to seven years sabbatical. So, um, and also our pastors get four weeks every year to minister somewhere else. That's 12 weeks right there when you come to a sabbatical year because we're about building the kingdom, not just about building Gateway Church. Um, So anyway, we, uh, we implemented this, so we're five years into the church. Um, I'm exhausted. The church is growing. It's uh, the book, The Blessed Life, had taken off. Um, I mean, it was just, it was just, I'd just gotten to busy, busy, busy. Wasn't resting one day a week. Didn't even have this, this, this is when God started dealing with me about this. But I went uh, on a trip for Life Outreach International, which is James Robinson's ministry, and we're going to um, these feeding places where children are dying. I'm looking directly into a camera, uh, asking people to support that it's real. The, the, the well waters, the water wells really help. The funds you give, that's, it goes there, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's real. It's not a television program. It's a ministry that's helping people, you know. So they feed about a half a million people uh, every day. And so I'm, I'm there and babies are dying in our arms in some of these places. And I'm looking in the camera, communicating, it's such an emotional drain. Uh, other things were going on. I've come home, I'm exhausted. I mean, I'm exhausted and I'm going right back into it. I know now when you come home from an overseas trip, take some time off. But I didn't know that then. And so I go right back into it. So I'm getting ready to go to the office 
and I hate to tell you this story, but I'm gonna tell you. I get out of the shower, go into my closet, I open my underwear drawer, and there's one pair of underwear. And I'm standing there thinking, what am I gonna do tomorrow? And I'm so tired, my mind can't think. I, 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 the thought, I could wash, never came to my mind. <laughs> I can go to Walmart and buy 12 pair for 79 cents, you know? <laughs> I just thought, I'm, I'm not gonna have underwear tomorrow. Pastors should wear underwear. <laughs> it's in the Bible. <laughs> Priests are not supposed to chafe when they minister. It's in the... <laughs> Isn't that what the Bible says? All right, it's something like that. It's close, okay? <laughs> so I put the underwear on. I open my sock drawer, and there are no socks. And I started crying. <laughs> and I sat down on the floor in my underwear <laughs> and cried. And I went to lunch that day with Tom Lane. And I leaned across the table to him and I said, Tom, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> he said, what do, you, what do you mean? So I told him, I cried in my underwear <laughs> over socks. He said, you're not losing your mind, Pastor. You're tired. You're exhausted. Any human would be. And that's when I took my first sabbatical. And the church uh, gave me eight weeks and on the last week, we did this Alaskan cruise. And I was sitting there on the deck with Debbie. She was reading a book. I was reading a book. Nothing about leadership. Uh, it was about, I was reading about Alaskan fishing boats. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the church had been going five years. All of a sudden, I thought, I feel normal again. I'm back to normal. I feel like I did before I started the church. I feel like me again. And the Lord said to me, what day is it in your sabbatical? And I said, it's the 53rd day. And he said, uh-huh, you owed 52 days. One year of sabbaticals, of Sabbaths, one year. You owed 52 days. And I said, Lord, you mean I owed you 52 days? He said, no, no, you owed you. 52 days. He said, son, the Sabbath's not for me. It's for you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to just take a moment. And a lot of times I say, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? I know what the Holy Spirit's saying to us. He might, he might direct it personally to you. I understand that. But I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a commitment. I just want you to tell him, to the best of my ability, Lord. I'm gonna honor the Sabbath. I started to say I'm gonna rest one day a week, I'm gonna take a day off, but it goes deeper than that. This is the Bible, this is spiritual. This is something God put for our benefit. So I just want you to make that commitment. Lord, to the best of my ability, please help me. Like the man said, I believe, but help my unbelief. So it's, that's one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. Lord, I'm gonna try, but help me because you know me. So I just want you to take a moment and just say, Lord, to the best of my ability, I'm going to honor the Sabbath. And the Lord will show you what day and how to do it and you know, small children and uh, a church where you, maybe it's a, you're, you're kind of it, you do everything. I understand all those things, but God will show you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that we will honor all 10 of the commandments. 
and that we will honor the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Robert, and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Be sure to share what God is teaching you in the comments below so that it might encourage others. And click the subscribe button and then tap the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget, you can watch full episodes anytime right here on my YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching.